Welcome, everybody. My name is Mina Jane. I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library. And as you can tell, I have a little bit of a cold, but there was no way I was going to miss this talk with John Laysat, the curatorial director of the Hammond Castle Museum in Gloucester. It it is, I'm definitely going to be hitting that spot very this next summer because it just sounds amazing. So we're going to be learning all about the castle, but I, and its uh, original owner, uh, John, Ham John Hayes Hammond Jr., who was an amazing person. So, but before we do that, I wanted to say a couple things. One is I'd like to thank the friends of the Ashland Public Library who support all of our programming, of course, and um, John for letting us share this program with other um, communities and libraries. So wherever you heard about us from, you know, another library, your great aunt Norma, you're welcome here. We're so glad you are here and you heard about this. So um, John's going to be talking for about 50 minutes to an hour, and then he's going to take questions. I'm going to ask you to put your questions in the Q&A because the uh, chat goes by too quickly for us to follow. So I'll be, um, if I can, moderating questions to John um, after his talk. John, thank you so much for being here. I'm, I'm thrilled. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for having me today. Um, so as you said, uh, my name is John Layseth. I'm the curatorial director at Hammond Castle Museum in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And uh, today I'd like to take you through the history of our unique building, its inspirations, development, purpose, and ongoing mission. So first of all, we're gonna switch things over here. It's my presentation. All right, look inside Hammond Castle Museum. So this is the view of the castle's south side from the ocean. Um, as you can see, stands out a little bit. <laughs> so really, Hammond Castle Museum was the brainchild of John Hayes Hammond Jr., aka Jack Hammond. Though relatively obscure today, Hammond was a well-known and extremely prolific inventor during the first half of the 20th century and was mentored by or collaborated with technological titans such as Thomas Edison, Alexander Graham Bell, and Nikola Tesla. Hammond is most remembered for his work with wireless technology uh, and is often referred to as the father of radio control. So drones, guided missiles, and RC cars owe a great deal to Hammond's pioneering work at the Hammond Radio Research Corporation. But the inventor's output was not limited to this field. Indeed, uh, Hammond was one of this country's most active and diverse inventors. Uh, he began filing patents in 1909, and his final one was granted in 1967, uh, two years after his death. In total, Hammond was granted no fewer than 551 registered patents when you combine his domestic output of 437 and his foreign count of 114. So clearly he was a busy man. Now, Jack Hammond was born in 1888 in San Francisco, California to this guy that you see on your screen, John Hayes Hammond Sr. and uh, his mother, Natalie Harris Hammond. So the father became an extraordinarily wealthy man due to his work in the silver, gold, and diamond mining industries. His genius for sniffing out the most lucrative deposits of minerals earned him the moniker, the man with the Midas touch. And that wealth uh, provided Jack and his siblings with, with many opportunities in life. Now, between 1896 and 1899, the Hammonds lived in England. And this is where the first seeds that would blossom into Hammond Castle Museum were sown. It was young Jack Hammond's early exposure to Norman castles like that one that you see on your screen that inspired his dreams of living in one someday. While his parents took a dim view of such ambitions, the lack of modern plumbing being one particularly glaring downside to living in a castle, the boy was undeterred. If buying a castle was out of the question, he'd just have to build one of his own. One that did and still does have modern plumbing, I, I can assure you of that. Um, 
Yeah, so Hammond's first attempt at constructing his own castle was actually on his parents' property. In 1903, the Hammond family purchased a large plot of land at Lookout Hill on Western Avenue in Gloucester with the intention of building a summer home there. This they did, and well, Jack lived with his brothers in a separate home on the same property, known colloquially as the bungalow. By the early 1920s, Hammond had established a career for himself as a respected and internationally famous inventor whose work was of interest to governments and corporations alike. In 1923, he sold a number of his patents to RCA, the Radio Corporation of America, for about half a million dollars, the equivalent of about eight and a quarter, eight and a half million dollars in today's money making him independently wealthy, although he still lived on his family's estate. Now, this photo that you see uh, shows Hammond's first castle, although it was actually never completed. Uh, that said, you can still see these foundations uh, from Stage Fort Park in Gloucester today. Uh, you might ask why he stopped there. Well, in short, uh, because his mother kind of kicked him out. Okay, so a little context is called for here. You see, Hammond married a Gloucester woman by the name of Irene Fenton. Uh, you can see her right there on your screen. Now, there's some debate about when they actually got married, if they got legally married. Uh, the story is that they did get married in Italy sometime prior to 1926. Uh, the exact date, we just haven't uncovered it yet. We haven't found an official marriage certificate yet. Um, so th that's, that's all we can really say right now. Um, but the union did become public knowledge in August of 1926 and Hammond's parents were hardly thrilled about it. The fact of the matter is that, um, they did not approve of that woman you see there, uh, Irene. So first of all, before she was Irene Fenton Hammond, she was Irene Fenton Reynolds. She had been previously married to a local shoe dealer named Frederick Reynolds, and the couple had gotten divorced uh, before her marriage to Hammond. Um, divorce was unfortunately a source of social stigma at the time, especially to a high society woman like Hammond's mother, and complicating matters was Irene's age. She was already in her early to mid-40s at the time their marriage became known, um, while he was seven years younger than her. Uh, Irene's age and relatively poor health, coupled with Hammond's seeming ambivalence towards having children, meant that there would be no offspring. Um, the, Hammond, the Hammond parents, especially the mother, who you can see uh, here, placed a great deal of value on lineage and keeping the family name alive for another generation. So this was a bit of a sticking point. Although, to be fair to Jack Hammond, none of his siblings had children either, so we can't blame him alone for why there are no living Hammonds today from that line. In any event, Hammond cited this contentious issue as the rationale for his mother's evicting him from the bungalow, though there might have been other factors as well. Hammond was understandably irked by this, but the rift was not permanent. Well, it was permanent, uh, we hope anyway, <laughs> was the site of Hammond's second try at building a castle. You see here an early blueprint aerial view of the proposed um, position that the uh, museum would be built upon. Um, so construction on what became known as Hammond Castle Museum began in 1926 and lasted primarily through 1929. Um, that doesn't mean all of the building that you see today was completed by 1929. There were additions later on in the 1930s, but the bulk of it became, um, and when it became habitable, uh, we say was done by 1929. So to bring his vision to life, Hammond hired Allen and Collins. Uh, this was a Boston-based architectural firm that specialized in Gothic revival architecture. Um, Hammond was not the only wealthy individual interested in building his own medieval inspired residence around this time. Um, for example, you might also be familiar with Hearst Castle in California, built by publishing magnate William Randolph Hearst, uh, who was actually another one of Hammond's associates. Uh, and the inventor was referred to Allen and Collins, who built Hammond Castle Museum 
uh, by one of his closest companions, a man by the name of Leslie Buswell. So let's talk a little bit about um, some of Hammond's friends, his, his close companions. Um, Hammond was part of a social group that is today locally known as BASH. Okay, so that's an acronym derived from the last names of its members. The B comes from Leslie Buswell, who was a British-born actor, as well as a scientist himself, who served in the American Field Service during World War I. And he was also a pilot for the United States in World War II. Uh, a. Pyatt Andrew gives us the A, who, and he was a former congressman from this district, uh, as well as an assistant secretary of the Treasury for President Taft. And President Taft, by the way, was a really close friend of uh, Hammond Sr. And the founder uh, of the American Field Service, uh, Apide Andrew, was as well. So Apide Andrew started the American Field Service, the Ambulance Corps in France, and uh, Leslie Buswell went over to serve in that. Um, Henry Davis Sleeper is the one who gives us the S. He was a famed interior designer, and, well, the H, of course, comes from Hammond. It should be noted that there is little evidence that the group used the term bash to describe themselves, however. Now, Buswell, Andrew, and Sleeper also built fantastic homes in Gloucester. You see the one on your screen, that is Stillington Hall, which still exists in a form today. Um, now, A. Pyatt Andrew, uh, that's a photo of Leslie Buswell, by the way. Um, you see here, that's A. Pyatt Andrew. That's Henry Davis Sleeper as a younger man. This is Red Roof. This was built by um, A. Pied Andrew. Uh, it doesn't really exist anymore in any form that you would, you know, recognize from the original today. Um, but this does. This right here is uh, Beauport. Uh, this is on Eastern Point in Gloucester. This is Sleeper's home. Um, it's called the Sleeper McCann House to this day because a uh, family named McCann uh, purchased the property and added their own touches to it later on. But it functions as a museum. Um, very, very worth the visit if you get a chance to go there. Um, so let's get back to Hammond Castle uh, specifically. So Hammond's architectural philosophy um, was very much influenced by the Gothic ethos, if you can call it that. If you've ever visited our museum, or if you ever do, you'll notice that it has a somewhat discordant feeling. Um, so what we call Hammond Castle is, is really something of a misnomer. The proper name of the building is simply the Hammond Museum. Uh, only a relatively small part of the building is actually a castle. Uh, granted, it's a very tall part of the building, um, but, uh, you know, still part of a greater hall. It's about a little over 80 feet high at the tallest points of the towers. Now, when you first enter the building, you see here the main entrance, you're actually walking into what used to be Hammond's laboratory back in the day. So this section here was Hammond's laboratory. Uh, and this is an archival photo showing you one of the rooms inside that lab. Now, today it's been extensively remodeled since that time. It would have been a tall order to expect the museum to operate a circa 1930s era laboratory filled with radio equipment after all, although I think that would be a lot of fun, but I digress. Now, that portion does lead you into the castle part of the building, which begins across from our uh, non-functional, I should say, uh, drawbridge. Don't blame us, it was never functional as anything other than a standard bridge. Um, now, most of the castle portion of the building, this is uh, an old photo from inside the tower, uh, most of the castle part of the building isn't open to the public anymore, unfortunately, because of these things called fire codes. Um, yeah, apparently when you have a single point of entrance and egress, namely the spiral staircase that leads up to the tower, that's a bit of an issue for the fire department, and it would be a massive, massive project to make it, um, up to code, so we had to close off the tower galleries, unfortunately, and today they're used for uh, storage as well as um, entrance into the pipe organ. Yeah, so Hammond, you see Hammond himself right here, uh, 
taking a ladder down to one of the organ chambers. This is something that Hammond's very well known for. It's another reason, really, he built his home the way he did, to have enough space to install the instrument. It's a custom design divided into several galleries containing over 8,300 pipes arranged in 137 ranks throughout these chambers. The pipes range in size from about the length and diameter of a drinking straw up to 32 feet in length. The organ is currently undergoing a major restoration project to bring it back to playing shape uh, as it hasn't been used for about 20 years, but it's gonna take a little bit of time. One of our big fundraising projects at the moment uh, concerns that organ restoration project, which is really tied in with the restoration project of the building itself. Now, uh, if you move past the entrance to the tower and the drawbridge door, it brings you to a spiral staircase made out of stone you see down here, um, leading away from the castle and the upper hall to the lower hall. Now, these steps that you see were designed to seem old and worn down, uh, leading to what we call a, a dishing or a cupping effect, um, meaning there are dips and curves in the steps, uh, and a large uh, stone railing is built into the wall on the left. Uh, once you get to the lower hall, a set of large uh, Gothic uh, double doors lead you into the Great Hall, which is really the centerpiece of the museum. So you see here, this is a, a photo taken of the Great Hall. Um, this is taken from the Minstrel Gallery, which is kind of an overlook, so you can get a really good um, sense of what it contains from here. Now, uh, it was modeled after a 13th century French Gothic cathedral. It measures approximately 68 feet long, uh, 23 feet wide, and 56 feet high. And while historical accuracy was important to Hammond, he wasn't obsessed with adherence to tradition. And to that end, acoustics actually took precedence over aesthetics here. See, Hammond used the Great Hall as both a concert venue and a recording studio for his pipe organ. So you see these walls here. Now, they have a sort of bumpy or ripple texture that acts sort of like a, a sound dampening foam you might find on the walls of a conventional recording studio. And their purpose was partially to reduce unwanted echo or reverberation. Um, likewise, the Great Hall features a, a false ceiling. Um, the building actually continues over 20 feet beyond it at its highest point. And this also helps to shape the sound of the room. Um, so acoustics weren't the only factors that caused Hammond to deviate from a tradition for his simulated cathedral. The Great Hall, like other cathedrals, figures a, uh, features a circular rose window near its apex. You can see a blueprint of uh, the design of that rose window, in fact, there. Now, Hammond's window faces away from what you would call the apse of the hall whereas rose windows normally face towards the apse so that the sunlight would shine towards the bishop and the other priests. But the reason for, for this switch was practical. See, the wall facing the apse is an interior wall, and so less light would be able to leak through it. So as a result, Hammond reversed the position of the rose window to an exterior wall so that light would point in the direction of our courtyard. Now, another break from tradition here is the uh, stained glass windows that line uh, the Great Hall. Uh, you see some of them here. Now, these are smaller than the windows of actual cathedrals. This was also done for practical reasons. You see, smaller windows were less expensive to produce and they're more heat efficient, which also makes them more economical. Very little of the stained glass in the museum is medieval in origin, although most of the windows are based on historical designs. Oddly, while Hammond commissioned these windows, the ones that you see there, evidently he, he never actually got around to installing them in his lifetime. It appears they were only added several years after his death. All right, now the entire building is a hodgepodge of real and simulated architectural elements. Hammond was always concerned about presentation first and foremost with authenticity perhaps a secondary concern. Unfortunately, this has led to a great deal of mythology around our museum, which, you know, and it has claims ranging from partially inaccurate to patently absurd. Uh, perhaps the wildest claim is that the entire building is composed of a real European castle that Hammond bought, disassembled, 
and rebuilt in the United States. Yeah, that's not true. But the grain of truth in that story is that pieces of the building have ancient and medieval origins, but hardly the whole entity. Most of the building was new construction with locally sourced materials, such as granite from Rockport, as well as cast stone, which is a sort of concrete material. Now, Hammond's collection is not what you might expect of a medieval enthusiast. For the most part, the inventor seemed to eschew uh, the familiar trappings of knighthood, uh, such as suits of armor and, and weaponry. In stark contrast to the man you see there, his one-time friend, John Woodman Higgins, the Worcester-based businessman who founded the now defunct Higgins Armory Museum. So um, his collection is today, or at least part of his collection is today is housed in the Worcester Art Museum. Um, I say he was a one-time friend because the subject of medieval arms and armaments was reportedly a sticking point between them. According to an anecdote from one of our former curators, uh, apparently Higgins attempted on several occasions to convince Hammond to collect these sorts of items with grandiose dreams of combining their collections and staging exhibitions and tournaments and so forth. Uh, but the inventor reportedly got so sick of this pestering that he stopped talking to Higgins. Uh, nevertheless, there is actually some textual evidence, scant though it might be, that Hammond at least considered the possibility of collecting and showcasing medieval armaments, uh, at least in the early stages of his museum planning. Ultimately, however, Hammond acquired very little in the way of swords, shields, or any of the other items in the arsenal of the medieval knight. Very little in his original collection has much connection to this subject, apart from a, a few notable examples here and there, such as a 16th century Swiss Zweihander. Um, now, this is a, a two-handed sword that uh, was given to him by another friend who collected these types of items, uh, Clarence H. McKay, and that resides in our Great Hall. And there are a few other scattered pieces, not currently on display as well. Hammond instead focused on collecting religious pieces and stone artifacts. Uh, the great irony is that Hammond was probably not a particularly religious man. Um, I suppose his beliefs could be described as ambiguously agnostic at most. Um, he shared an interest in spiritualism and astrology with his wife and he was raised Episcopalian. Um, but I, I wouldn't call him especially devout. So it's, it's a little bit of an open question, just how strongly he held any sort of religious beliefs. Um, what isn't ambiguous is that he had a great affinity, at least for the aesthetics of medieval religious works. Um, the stone pieces seem to be his favorites, and particularly he's inspired by that building you see on your screen, the Lapidary Museum in Avignon, France. And he wanted his museum to be a lapidarium as well, which is specifically a type of museum that focuses on stone pieces. Now, one example of this is built into our great hall, an area we call the Bishop's Alcove uh, for the presence of a bishop's chair or cathedra, which from which the term cathedral derives, incidentally. Now, this alcove is a pastiche of Byzantine era marble from probably Northern Italy dated roughly from the sixth to eighth centuries. Although there's more to that story I'll, I'll get to in just a moment. Um, the thing is some, like some other items in our collection, these pieces, uh, which consist of a cathedra, a screen and an archway there, these were actually recarved from their original forms likely at some point during the half century between Italian unification and the period in which Hammond was collecting in the 1920s. It's sad to say, but it actually was common practice for antiques dealers to hire forgers to carve new designs over the original carvings of ancient Roman artifacts, such as chairs and sarcophagi. The reasons for this were the same that underlie the modern practice of upcycling old furniture. Uh, refurbishing an item in hopes of being able to sell it for more money than it would go for otherwise. This could have been because the original carvings were badly damaged, or even because the piece was deemed to be too plain, uh, to be attractive to wealthy American collectors like Hammond. 
So this is an example of a recarved Roman child sarcophagus from our collection, which is not currently on display, but hopefully will be uh, again at some point in the not too distant future. Um, one of the telltale signs is that this is a child sarcophagus, but this is an adult face that is carved here into the Clypeus. So they kind of goofed there. Now, opposite the Bishop's alcove is the largest of many fireplaces in the building. Its frame sourced from the wreckage of a chateau north of Verdun in France, which was apparently hit by a bomb during the First World War. The frame could date anywhere from the 13th to 15th centuries. I'd like to take a slight tangent here to talk about fireplaces in general. We have no fewer than 10 fireplaces throughout the public spaces of the museum with additional examples in employee only areas. Uh, in our great hall, as mentioned, and as you see there on the screen, but also uh, in our upper hallways reception room, that's this one here. We have one in our sunroom, which is a little um, nook off to the side of our great hall. We have one here in our courtyard. We have one in what is now our invention room. We have one in our exhibit room, the Natalie Hammond room, named in honor of Hammond's sister. Uh, we have one in the Gothic guest room. We have one in this early American style guest room. We have one in our library and we have one in what we call the war room, which was like a dining, casual dining area and a, and a study uh, that Hammond had. So with, uh, with so many fireplaces, it's understandable that, um, let me skip ahead there. It's understandable that uh, a lot of people ask us if that was how the building was heated in Hammond's time, but no, that is, that is not true. Uh, despite the fireplaces being functional, the primary heat source was very modern at the time, uh, a radiant heat system using oiled fired force steam radiators. See, Hammond wanted to live in a castle, yes, but with all the modern conveniences, of course. All right, so next to the fireplace in the Great Hall is this little button here on the wall. It's one of many uh, we have in the building wired together electrically in a call button system for summoning Hammond's domestic staff. When pushed, each button sent a signal to multiple call boxes mounted to the walls in areas of the building where the staff members typically spent the most time. Um, this one that you see here, for example, uh, was in the staff dining area. The boxes themselves are recessed into the walls with rows of numbers corresponding to uh, different rooms. Uh, they're behind a glass window. The signal caused a small flag to drop in front of the number that matched the room where the button was pressed and a bell would sound to catch a staff member's attention. Now, next to the Great Hall is the sun room. This is a cozy little nook and it gets a lot of sunlight, strangely enough. Uh, yeah. So it appears to have been used as sort of a, a living room, a relaxing sort of environment of sorts by Mr. and Mrs. Hammond. And there's also a, a doorway that you see in the left side of the photo over here. This leads down to our ocean facing south lawn. Now the steps at the end of the great hall lead up to different rooms, the courtyard and the Sicilian room. Uh, the latter is a small sort of uh, vestibule that acts as uh, a nexus between the dining room and the floor below. And it has some Sicilian tiles embedded into the walls there. And the former is another marquee space inspired partially by the similar space at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. Gardner, the famous art collector in Hammond, were friends of a sort. I, I sometimes joke that they were frenemies as they did have a tendency to kind of have differences of opinion and they, they bickered from time to time, uh, evidenced by their correspondence. However, he obviously respected Gardner and uh, was in prominent attendance at her funeral along with the other uh, so-called Bash members. Uh, Hammond crafted his courtyard, which you see at the top photo here on the left, uh, which he simply referred to, by the way, as the patio, uh, to resemble a rural French village of the late medieval period built on ancient Roman ruins. So it was kind of a concept room meant to make fe visitors feel perhaps as if they had just left a church in the form of the Great Hall and were now entering the town square. And you see right there below the Isabella Stewart Gardner's Museum's courtyard. They're not identical by any means, but you can definitely see the influence that she had on Hammond there. 
So this uh, effect was realized by the glass um, greenhouse roof, often known as the clear story, uh, recently restored, and uh, a variety of tropical plants and trees. So it's the new, the new improved glass ceiling that we have over the courtyard today. Now, <clears throat> embedded within the courtyard's walls are the wooden facades of French storefronts uh, from the towns of Tours and Amiens. Now, these date from the 13th to 15th centuries. One of these might be from a bakery, this one that you see on the left, although other theories have been suggested. It's composited together with pieces of other buildings. So this part on the top, this part in the bottom are two separate buildings that were composited together. Uh, another one that you see to the right, that's clearly from a butcher shop decorated with sculptures of men holding animals, um, specifically a cow, a pig, a rabbit, a chicken, and a fish, well, there's another, well another one is from uh, a tavern. Now, these uh, pieces that you see here, these are archways that we have in the courtyard. Uh, the room features a large flamboyant Gothic archway, that's this left image here, from a small French village called Varennes, made from limestone. Uh, There's a replacement for the original arch, which was made of cast stone, that concrete material I mentioned earlier. That was a planar design. Um, now, the archway that actually leads into the courtyard from uh, the Great Hall, which you see here on the right, that's made of blocks that Hammond sourced from uh, Naples in Italy. The blocks were said to have originated from a church in Ravello, Italy, not far from the slopes of Mount Vesuvius. But as the blocks are, and as the blocks are made of volcanic stone, it's been theorized that they had their origin in uh, one of the legendary volcano's eruptions. Excuse me, excuse me a moment. <clears throat> All right, so moving on. The central feature of the courtyard is a swimming pool, about eight and a half feet deep. Uh, the pool features an optical illusion from the floor level, where if it's freshly filled with clear water, it appears to have a shallow end, like a, a ramp that seems to lead up towards the back end of the pool. However, it's uniformly deep. Lore has it that Hammond had the water colored with some sort of translucent green refractive dye to further bend the light and make the pool appear very shallow, only to surprise guests by diving right in. But that's one of those colorful stories that, um, you know, a little bit hard to verify. Um, the inventor is also said to have installed what was known as a weather system inside the courtyard's rafters, which was essentially an advanced sprinkler system that could generate anything from a dense mist to a torrential downpour. Now, uh, archival photographs commissioned by Hammond, colorized version that you see here, uh, have much the effect of a, of a tropical jungle. Now, Hammond also reportedly installed a uh, light on a motorized track to simulate the passing of the moon at night and reportedly had some sort of thunder and lightning simulator sound machine, but I, I haven't seen any direct evidence of that. It wouldn't surprise me either though. Um, in any case, legend has it that, the, that Hammond used to prank his late dinner guests using this weather system. The inventor would wait for them to enter the courtyard via the guest rooms, which in turn led to the dining room and turn on the waterworks, soaking them and making them even wet clothes, and that they learned to be punctual in the future. Um, again, I'm not sure if that actually happened, but uh, it's a fun story nonetheless, and I wouldn't have put it past him. Now, speaking of the dining room, it's decorated in a Renaissance style. It's quite international in character. Um, the floor tiles that you see down here. Um, these are likely from the 19th century. They were made in imitation of medieval, possibly Italian designs. However, they came from a French manufacturer called Boulanger. Um, floor tiles from the medieval period, uh, they were typically around an inch thick and composed of a mixture of red, white, and or black clay, similar to what you see there. Um, most medieval workers were specialists, but Tyler's kind of had a unique dual career path. In the summer, when the weather was warmer and brighter, 
they could uh, make and install tiles. But in the colder months of winter, working with clay became more difficult. And the early nights also complicated their work and limited what they could do. So as a result, tilers would spend the off season, so to speak, engaged in, I guess, the equivalent of what we call landscaping today, tending to hedges and so forth. Um, there are also tiles on the ceiling that you see here of a similar vintage, um, but these are all original. Um, these are Spanish and were a gift from uh, Hammond's friend, Leslie Buswell. All right, the walls are German, uh, also 15th century, uh, came from a monastery. They're carved in what is known as Lig Ouvert or open book pattern because they resemble open book pages. Uh, this is appropriate given that German monasteries were repositories of many rare tomes. So you see that sort of looks like the open pages of a book here with the uh, spine in the center. Now the room's table that you see here is also German, dated to the 16th century. Many of our guests noticed that the table is actually quite narrow. It's typical of the time period. Chairs were placed actually on a single side back uh, at that time as well as at the ends, but one side was left open to give servants room to set down plates of food. For example, you see on the right there, Da Vinci's Last Supper painting. Uh, Jesus and the apostles are all seated on one side of the table. And the old joke is that they look like they're posing for a photograph, but the artist was really just referencing the dining style of his time there. Now on one uh, wall of the room is a large painting which was possibly once part of a church's altar screen. It's dated to the mid 15th century and it was painted by the Spanish master of Villalobos. And it depicts the martyrdom of St. Romanus of Caesarea. Now Romanus was a deacon of the early Christian church in what is today Northern Israel during the late third and early fourth centuries. This was during the time of the last of the great persecutions against, against Christians by the Roman empire named the Diocletianic Persecution after the Emperor Diocletian. Romanus protested anti-Christian laws within the empire that sought to impose pagan practices on its citizens. And he went as far as disrupting a public ritual sacrifice, was arrested as a result, and sentenced to death. Now, according to his hagiography, the official church's record of his life, he was to be burned at the stake. But a sudden rain shower extinguished the flames, and saved his life, attributed to being a miracle. Of course, in order to qualify for sainthood, a minimum of two miracles are required. Um, so Romanus II is actually depicted in our painting, um, in our painting here. Um, his tongue was torn out as a form of torture, yet he was still said to have been able to preach the gospel despite this deficiency. Um, he was ultimately executed by strangulation. And we tell that story because according to an anecdote, which again, take with a grain of salt, um, the anecdote claims that Hammond told his guests that story over an appetizer of beef tongue and cherry sauce. If that's true, yeah, hardly a devout man. And one might argue that this particular joke was in poor taste. But again, it's a funny story. We don't know if that's actually true. Um, next to the dining room is our library. Um, oh, sorry, that's the side pantry that you actually see there. Um, we have some dishware there. Um, this is the library. Uh, so this is actually a circular room. And uh, it appears to bear the influence possibly of Henry Davis Sleeper, but that's actually uncertain. Um, the library has an 18 inch dome ceiling, although it's not immediately apparent due to it being painted matte white. It's actually known as a whisper ceiling. Its purpose is to amplify sound due to a parabolic acoustic effect um, made possible by the ceiling and the round shape of the room. You can quite clearly hear soft voices from across the room, not that it's terribly large to begin with. And if one stands at the center and speaks out loud, they'll experience a sort of loudspeaker echoing effect that only they can hear as the sound waves return to them. So if you ever come by, give it a shot. It's kind of fun. Um, housed in Hammond's library is part of his extensive collection of books. Um, they numbered roughly four to 5,000 at the time of his death, but about half were reportedly donated to the Sawyer Free Library in Gloucester and some other places. 
The library also features a ring of red neon lighting near its ceiling, though we don't really use that today. Um, the original plans called for the library to hide a door behind a bookcase, but it's unclear if Hammond implemented this. At present, the door to the room below is in plain view, but that room very much does contain uh, a hidden bookcase door, which we'll get to. So you can see here, this is the door that leads below. Now uh, this is the war room. We call it the war room. It served a number of purposes during and after Hammond's life. Uh, it's circular, just as the library above is, and mounted to its wall is a large painting that you see here spanning nearly half the room, done for Hammond by Eric Pape, who was a multi-talented and well-known artist during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Although Pape has now become obscure, the museum did feature an exhibition of his work this past April, and we plan to stage another one next year. In any case, the mural depicts a fanciful scene of naval warfare, sort of what-if scenario of German ships attacking Gloucester Harbor during World War I. And in it, Hammond's own inventions are summoned to the defense of the harbor, such as his radio-guided torpedoes. You can see the, the wake of those there. Um, the painting was restored actually in 2020, thanks to a generous contribution by Dr. Gregory Kahn, the world's foremost collector of Pape's work and the sponsor of our Pape exhibit. So we're very grateful to him for that. Now, today we use the war room to focus on Hammond's naval and military work, but its secrets are not limited to uh, weapons of war. See that hidden door I mentioned is not behind the bookcase, but is itself a bookcase. It's propped open here. Blue shelves line much of the room and one of these can be opened to reveal Hammond's hidden wine cellar, which wraps around the side of the war room to the adjacent kitchen. Why was it hidden? Well, do recall that the castle was built between 1926 and 1929 when prohibition was still very much the law of the land in this country. Now, Hammond had been permitted to move his pre-existing supply of wine that he had acquired prior to the passing of the 18th Amendment in 1919 to the building, but he wasn't legally allowed to buy any other alcohol, nor was anybody else. Like many others during the Roaring Twenties, however, he didn't let a pesky little thing like the law stop him from obtaining many rare and fine beverages, the suppliers of which were to be kept confidential to quote a letter to his brother, Harris. Um, the secret wine cellar was the vault in which these were kept. More recently, myself and members of our staff have discovered a small seaside cave actually on the property uh, embedded in the rocks next to the ocean. And we actually found a lot of antique liquor bottles and other such things from this time period. So they apparently used it as a bit of a dumping ground. All right, as mentioned before, the kitchen is next to the war room and it's undergone extensive remodeling since Hammond's time, partially due to an unfortunate flooding incident in the 1980s. Uh, today, we use it as a space to focus on the appliances Hammond invented for the home, such as his panless stove that you see there. Uh, this dispensed of pans in favor of foil that could be discarded instead of cleaned after dinner. Not very green, I know, but it was invented in the 1950s after all. Uh, we also showcase the meals the Hammond actually might have eaten, as well as uh, branded products that they purchased. Now, a lot of visitors are surprised that the kitchen is on the bottom floor while the dining room is on the second level. Uh, there's a couple reasons for that. First of all, transport of food could be accomplished via means of a dumbwaiter, a little elevator that would lead from the bottom to the top floor. That's no longer installed, but between the kit and that was um, that led from the kitchen specifically to the side pantry, which is next to the dining room. And um, not only that, but the war room right next to the kitchen, as I said, was used as an informal dining room by Hammond. So that was just one room away. All right, moving on. Um, next to the kitchen is the staff dining room, which is a small space connected to a corridor that leads to the outside of the building and it's behind this door with the imposing looking knocker that you see here. And this is where it comes out outside. See, in those days, domestic staff would enter and exit discreetly to avoid disturbing their employer's social functions, for example. Um, 
Today, the rooms lining this corridor uh, are used mostly for storage. A uh, staircase to the right of this corridor leads back up to the uh, Great Hall in the Sicilian room. Now, switching over to the north side of the building off of the courtyard, the butcher shop facade here, that leads to two exhibit spaces. Um, to the right would be our uh, invention room, which focuses on Hammond's work as a scientist. And to the left over here would be the uh, Natalie Hayes Hammond room, which is named in honor of Hammond's sister, as I said earlier, and it's our space for temporary exhibits. The invention room was previously a colonial style guest bedroom, while the other was a sitting room. Um, as these are constantly changing spaces, I'm not gonna emphasize the architectural elements in these rooms, but as curator, a lot of my work involves the exhibits we feature in them. So as a, as a personal request, please don't skip them if you visit us. Now, the second level of the guest rooms uh, can be accessed one of two ways by taking a spiral staircase around the corner from the fireplace to the courtyard or by walking around to the south side of the courtyard up two uh, small flights of steps over a little bridge mezzanine area there. Um, the former route leads to the early American guest room while the latter leads to the Gothic guest room. And both of these are joined by a hallway that served as closets separated by a movable divider. Um, this is the hallway in question right here. So first of all, we have the Gothic guest room, which is, as its name implies, decorated in a medieval style. It features a 14th century Italian campaign bed, so named because its raw iron frame is collapsible for easy transport during military campaigns, as well as a brick floor reportedly sourced from the 16th century palace of Diego Columbus, son of Christopher in the Dominican Republic, although, a little bit skeptical of that claim, but that's what the story is. Um, what you see here, these are actually stones at the top of the spiral staircase that leads down to the Great Hall from the upper hallway. Those were said to have come from the first, first church Columbus built um, in the Dominican Republic. Um, and these skull fragments you see here were and this is something you should be very skeptical of. <laughs> they were said to have belonged to one of Columbus's crew members, but they're probably not. And they're actually composed of remains from multiple individuals. But Hammond was a bit of an admirer of Christopher, Christopher Columbus, who doesn't have the great reputation he once did today. Uh, but back in Hammond's time, he was certainly viewed heroically, especially by uh, Italians because of his own ancestry. All right, now, Next to the Gothic room is the early American guest room, which is also named after its style of decor. Its bed was once the bed of the inventor himself, actually moved down from Hammond's bedroom. Um, the most notable feature of this room is the wallpaper, which has had three designs over its history. Uh, in all cases, the wallpaper covered not only the walls, but the inside of the room's doors. Uh, when closed, the guest would appear to be trapped inside a doorless room with no obvious point of egress to the bathroom or any other area. And it's said that Hammond did this as a bit of a practical joke, but also kind of a trend back then to do this. Um, this room also provides a good view of the outside walls of the grounds. And if you look closely from the windows, you'll see these broken wine bottle pieces cemented into the tops of the walls, which apparently was a form of home defense. See Hammond's German shepherd, Boris, was once kidnapped in 1936 and held for ransom by someone who had climbed over the walls to capture him. And uh, the glass would act as a deterrent for future would-be dog nappers. Uh, should be noted, the Hammonds were big animal lovers, uh, especially uh, in Hammond's case of cats, but he also loved dogs. Um, now, were you to take the spiral staircase that leads um, to the early American room, up to another floor, you'd find what we call the butler's office down a small hallway uh, to basically tri pay tribute to Hammond's butler, an Englishman by the name of Leslie Hillman, who served the inventor over three decades. One of the call boxes mentioned earlier is actually outside of this room. 
Now, finally, the staircase takes you to one more level, what we call the Minstrel Gallery, a narrow hallway with an overlook of the Great Hall that can be seen through a screen. Now, it has this ornate medieval bench, which provides some respite for weary visitors. And the view, as you can see, is quite excellent from there. Um, the door beyond the gallery is not open to the public, but provides access to the ceiling of the courtyard. That about covers the interior of the building, at least the significant parts that are open to the public. There are plenty of other rooms that are not. The exterior is quite striking as well, of course. To the left of the main entrance is what we call the cloister section, uh, a later extension of the building completed in the 1940s. It uh, features columns and arches dating from the 13th century from Couvent des Cardeliers at Auc in Gares, France, a monastery founded by Franciscan monks. And thanks to the support from the city of Gloucester, we uh, recently restored these architectural artifacts. Now, the issue of restoration and maintenance is a big one at our museum. This is a unique and complex building with a host of challenges to keep running. The New England elements are hard on this nearly 100 year old castle, not the least because of the, shall we say, eccentric fashion in which it was constructed. Even by the time of Hammond's death in 1965, the building was a bit of a bear to maintain, to be honest, which accounts for why our organization ultimately became a private nonprofit. You see, Hammond actually willed his home initially to the care of the Catholic Church under the direction of Cardinal Richard Cushing, Archbishop of Boston at the time, depicted in this painting here. Pretty famous guy locally. Now, some of you might be familiar with him. He forged a lot of social connections outside the church and acquired a great deal of property on its behalf, including Hammond Castle Museum. And you might find it surprising that a largely secular scientist would choose to will his museum to the church, but there are a few reasons for this. First, his father had done the same thing with his property, despite not being Catholic himself. Why? Well, tax breaks. Um, See, Hammond saved a considerable amount of money by registering his home as a museum, as well as willing his property to the church. And second, Hammond's large religious medieval collection was kind of a natural fit for the church, and perhaps he might have felt that that organization would have a vested interest, no pun intended, in preserving it. Thirdly, his siblings were wealthy enough not to need the property, and they might not have been interested in the headaches associated with maintaining it either. The issue was that Cushing's expansion of the church's holdings was, was too expensive to bear, so uh, the church sought to liquidate itself of these assets following uh, his death in the early 1970s, and it was after this point that the museum became the private nonprofit that it is today. Now, whatever money Hammond left in the estate has only gone so far, and as a result, we are dependent on the support of the public and grants for our funding. And each ticket sold, each purchase made from the museum store helps to support our efforts to preserve Hammond's museum, its collection and our goal and our mission to, to educate the public about his life, his collection and his work. At present, our goals are to seal the ocean facing towers that you see there um, against water damage and to restore the pipe organ to playing condition, hopefully by 2025, but that all depends on how much funding we can raise. Uh, I encourage you to visit us during our open season, which generally runs from April through December. And thank you again so much for having me today. And that was amazing. Um, I wanna remind everybody that I have a bit of a cold, but I was not gonna miss this day. So, um, I want to ask, we do have a bunch of questions in the Q&A. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. I will be sending out a recording of this session after the program, um, if you have to leave. But um, I'm really curious why so many people were interested in medieval architecture back in Hammond's day. Um, the Hearst Castle looks more like 18th, 19th century. What? Because, yeah, there was no indoor plumbing. Mm. So... The romance of, of the medieval period is one of these things that kind of, you know, crests and troughs throughout, you know, the post-medieval world. Gothic revival architecture was something of a trend. Um, you started to see 
a lot of this really picked up steam in the 19th century. Um, it was something that, at least in Hammond's case, I think it's a way to feel connected to the past, mm -hmm. um, to a world which it was a very it was a very different culture in the medieval world. Um, the symbols, the the spiritualism, the the sp I should say the spirituality. I mean. Medieval Europe was was Christendom. And while Hammond may not have been excessively religious, I think something about that symbology appealed to him, something about that idea of connecting with something higher, something greater than himself, whether mm -hmm. that was a period of time in which, you know, the church was central to the society or just because we, we all stand on the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. And it's just it's large. It's physically imposing. It's impressive. And uh I think there could be a lot of reasons why Hammond and others like him were, were so interested in making their own simulacra of mm -hmm. such. Yeah, it's interesting that that period was romanticized when it was so... Anyways, I could talk about that all day. Um, mm -hmm. Christine says, when did the tower galleries close to the public? That was in the early 2000s. Um, updated fire codes and inspection basically said that if you only have one way that you can enter and exit this this kind of... Um, the stone spiral staircase, it just doesn't match. And so for visitors to be able to access that would be a big problem. We'd have to create another whole entrance. And that's frankly prohibitively expensive. And if we didn't do it right, it could also violate our status as a historic site because there's only so much modification we can actually do to the building. So uh, it's, it's unfortunate. I visited it when I was a child. It used to ho uh, house a collection of um, some authentic and some uh, largely replica medieval ar armaments and you know, swords and shields and armor and that sort of thing. But um, yeah, not much we can really do realistically about it, at least for the time being. Been there at a um, <clears throat> at a library that couldn't um, update because of, you know, rules and regulations. Um, right. Edward says, and I think you might have answered this, but does the Hammond organ have anything to do specifically with John Hammond Jr.? Okay, so we get this question a lot. Um, <laughs> actually, no, uh, not not technically. Um, it's a weird historical coincidence. There were two inventors with the last name Hammond, completely unrelated to each other, that were working about the same time. Their their lives overlap by about ten years on either side. The other one was from uh, the Midwest. His name was Lawrence Hammond. He's the actual inventor of the Hammond electric organ that was very popular. We get this all the time because it's a natural question right you know they're both Hammonds they have organs you'd think there was a connection but the funny thing is they did actually know each other they were aware of each other okay because people thought the same thing back in their li lifetimes so we actually have correspondence between the two our Hammond Jack Hammond wrote to the other one Lawrence Hammond and he stated essentially like it seems I have ridden to fame at the desk of your organs I hope my torpedoes have been also friendly to you. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. What they, a they, sense they were of humor. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I do want to say that people are very curious about um, Hammond. And I spoke to you about doing a second session just about him and his work. So we might be doing that in like January, February. I'll keep you all informed. Um, yeah, but I would love to do that. That would be fun, especially since this has been so fantastic. Um, Eileen says, where are were the homes of the other three bash members okay so fairly nearby um they're all they're all in gloucester okay so we have uh, we're in west gloucester hammond castle museum and then you have Beauport in east gloucester and stillington hall mm -hmm. um is actually cl fairly close by us as well in west gloucester so they're they're all sent they're all in gloucester um but as i said two function as museums today ours and Beauport, and the other one is a private residence but um, we do know the owner of it and we are, uh, we have, we're, we're friendly with him. So some members of our staff have actually been able to visit us, but Red Roof doesn't really exist in, in its real form anymore. No, oh, it's interesting that you guys haven't been absorbed into historic New England because Beauport and um, the yes. Sun House. Right. Yeah. But um, I guess, I guess we go our own way. <laughs> <laughs> which is wonderful. This is an interesting question, which I also had. Do you have any concerns about the provenance of anything in the museum or intentions to return anything in terms of original owners rather than forgeries? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. So this is a question that a lot of museums, frankly, are, are facing these days, the issue of repatriation and so forth, so forth. Um, you know, I 
I'm not in a position to give the museum's official position on that topic. Um, it is something that we're aware of. I can state that Hammond obtained all of his pieces legally, uh, you know, by the standards of his age. There is an open question of dealers. Where did they source their uh, items? There are some cases where items are not even sought after or wanted by their home mm -hmm. uh, government, uh, the country of, their, of origin. We have not yet encountered um, any requests to return anything that may have come from another country. Um, and it's something that we're aware of. And uh, certainly we will obey all ethical standards if and when those times, those requests come in. Um, but it's not something that we're presently dealing with, but it's something we're aware of. Mm -hmm. Blake asks, why is the casual, casual dining room called the war room? Well, we call it the war room um, <laughs> because uh, it has that large naval battle painting by Eric Pape. And while um, there, there, there are some stories that Hammond perhaps met military officials because he did a lot of military contracting um, at the time and it was kind of maybe intended as a private secret room and maybe that gave it its name but it it basically as as far as we can tell it was spent a lot of its time being used for kind of casual meals when the Hammonds didn't have company mm -hmm. um <clears throat> somebody asks if Hammond had personal documents diaries letters what things like that but I do want to reiterate that we're going to do a second session about Hammond and we will bring all those to light is that correct yeah, absolutely. Um, he's a fascinating ca uh, character, and not only as a hu human being, but as a scientist, which is my major interest. Um, his work, I think, deserves a lot more attention mm -hmm. um, than it receives uh, today. Um, Marianne says that her, her late uncle's sister was a domestic worker for the Hammond family for many years. Oh, okay. Um, question, Steve says, why is Hammond's story not more widely known? You were just talking about this. He has an interesting family background, interesting marriage, interesting. So uh, this is interesting because Hammond predicted this was going to be the case fairly early on. In fact, even before he built this place, he, he, 1924, actually. So we're talking almost 100 years ago he wrote a letter to his father and that thought and that letter stated that in a few years after I'm gone, all my inventions and scientific discoveries be old fashioned and forgotten. In these days, even careers are soon forgotten. Only that which meets the eye remains. Um, he realized that you know, science marches on, right? He was mentored by people like Edison and Bell and to a certain extent, Tesla, but he didn't, as important as he was in radio control and other fields, he realized, well, people will, people will improve upon it. And, and all you're going to really remember are the people who created something that was like truly iconic, something that was in everybody's home, like the telephone. That's mm -hmm. why we remember Alexander Graham Bell. We don't really remember him for his, his work with the deaf. We don't remember him for um, a lot of other reasons, but we remember him for the telephone mm -hmm. and that's, you need something like that. But Hammond realized that if people weren't going to remember him for his career, I mean, he didn't have any family to help carry on his name either because no children, that whole generation that just, that was the end of it. Mm -hmm. You know, the museum could be his legacy. Um, so this wouldn't be surprising to him that he fell into obscurity. I'm trying to change that. We're trying to change that. But, it, you know, it wasn't all that long ago that Nikola Tesla had fallen into obscurity, too. And now he's a household name again. And I'm really hopeful that we can do similarly for Hammond. But it's going to take a lot of time and opportunities like this to kind of talk to people and say, hey, this, this Hammond guy, he, he knew a thing or two or that you might not realize. <laughs> Um, Christine asks, when did this stop being a residence? I think you might have mentioned that. So this stopped officially being Hammond's residence in 1965 with his death. That being said, subsequent to that, there were other people who did live here. Um, Hammond's butler, Leslie Hillman, stayed on for a while. Also, the, um, the organist, Virgil Fox, uh, who was played a Hammond's organ before, he lived here with his mother for a period of time. 
There have even been some caretakers over the years that lived here. Um, but currently it is not. The last time somebody has really lived here, I think would be over 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. That's not that long ago. No, um, not that long, but those none of those people are, are involved uh, today mm -hmm. in the museum. Can you remind us why the water in the pool always looks so green? I thought that was a funny story and Barbara wanted to hear it again. Well, the story is that Hammond dyed it translucent green, but in reality today, why it's green is simply algae. The water is not treated. There would need to be upgrades and changes uh, to the, the filtration system to not have that happen. So the last time that it was clear was when we were repairing the glass ceiling over the courtyard in um, 2021. And so it was drained and then it was refilled. And then you could see before the algae took over again, you could see the optical illusion I was talking about. Um, but yeah, it's, it's because of algae. Fascinating. You had mentioned that the um, <clears throat> Hammond left a uh, castle to the Catholic Church. Did they receive compensation when the property changed to become the nonprofit museum? That's a question from Anne. Yeah, I mean, they they literally, I mean, they sold it. Yeah, yeah um, okay. a private um, nonprofit entity was was formed, and um, you know, it was basically basically sold off so that it could operate independently and that the church wouldn't have to deal with it anymore. Um, when Hammond died, Cardinal Cushing himself um, managed his estate and. Um, got money from that himself uh, but they opened it well i should say they reopened it it became a full-time museum in hammond's time it was a museum in fact we've legally been a museum since 1930 um like right after it was built and hammond had it on a very part-time basis open for people to view his collection but it was during cushing's term that it basically got turned into the full-time museum that it is mm -hmm. wow um, <clears throat> Debbie asks, it sounds like Hammond was a bit of a prankster or practical jokester. That Do you is have the story. a particularly fun favorite story of him doing something wacky? <laughs> well, there's a lot of fun stories. The problem is always finding evidence to support them because they're by their nature, they're anecdotes, they're anecdotal. Like, there might not always be a primary source document or something that confirms that this or that prank didn't happen. I can tell you some, some fun stories. Um, there is a, a story that Hammond recounted that you can actually find in the pages of a book, uh, which is in our library actually called The Complete Practical Joker, which is a collection of sort of notable people and funny pranks that they claim to have pulled. And one of them details how Hammond created like a fake sea monster uh, <laughs> and uh, set it afloat uh, in Gloucester Harbor. And of course, Gloucester has a local legend of a sea serpent from uh, centuries ago. So uh, again, I could I could totally see him doing that. Wouldn't have been at all beyond the realm of possibility. Um, there's another story that he used to claim that there was a secret tunnel behind the fireplace in the Great Hall that through which people could escape in the event that uh, the castle was under siege. Um, but in reality. There, there really is nothing but a very small like drainage tunnel behind there and you, you couldn't actually there's no door or anything um so those, those are a couple okay so we have a bunch of questions about one about you and one about the building itself um somebody says how did you come to accept this position with the museum was hammond always an interest of yours hammond himself no he wasn't always an interest of mine i first came to hammond castle museum when i was a child probably about eight years old um when my family moved to Gloucester, I, as a kid, was very interested in medieval knights and uh, King Arthur and all that kind of good stuff. I still like it today. Um, and so that was my initial attraction to the place was the medieval aspect of it. And back in the 1980s and 1990s, when I was younger, um, that was emphasized a lot more. That, And, you know, in some cases, a little bit too much. Mm -hmm. um, but over time, my sh interests shifted very quickly to Hammond as a scientist. One of my major interests is the history of technology. Um, I think through the story of technology, we can actually learn a lot about ourselves as, as human beings. And finding out all the different sciences, all the different technological fields that Hammond was involved with and filed patents for 
including some really unexpected ones. Um, for example, and maybe this is a teaser for a future talk, but he was a significant television pioneer in a way that, frankly, he has not given credit for. And recent uh, evidence has, has, come, has, has come to light, has seen the light of day again, which I think backs up that claim. So I just found him really, really interesting in terms of his work. I started out here as a tour guide. Um, and then really only a few months later, a position opened up uh, for curator. And, you know, my goal, you know, I am, I am unabashedly evangelical about uh, Hammond's work and his significance as a historical figure. And uh, I like to kind of expose uh, the public to that in interesting and hopefully novel ways. For example, created a few educational uh, video games that you can play if you come here that touch upon different aspects of Hammond's work. We have like a torpedo game where you can use radio guided torpedoes. We have a, a game that stars Salino, a robotic dog that Hammond helped create, believe it or not, in the 1910s. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of fun stuff, I think, uh, for people of all ages to come when you visit here. But I definitely enjoy my work. I'll say that much. And you had said before we <laughs> sorry, before we started that you actually created a graphic novel of the uh, uh, a short, yeah, six pages uh, of an adaptation of one of Hammond's uh, travel logs when he visited the Caribbean in 1934. He kept detailed <laughs> notes of his experiences. And some of them I thought could be dramatized into like a old school, like classic retro American comic, something you might've seen in the 1940s or 50s. So I created that and I'm hopeful that we can expand that with, uh, with more in the future. We have a board game that Hammond patented, believe it or not, back in 1912, a naval war game that we are just about to produce a second run of. Um, we're gonna have a game night actually here on November 22nd. And during that game night, the, the game will be available for purchase and play along with a bunch of other nice board games. So we, we try to do um, a lot of fun things, but we always try as much as possible, connect it to Hammond and his world. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. A couple of people um, asked, and I've seen this on your website, if weddings take place at the castle. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we do a lot of weddings uh, during the year, mostly on weekends, but um, sometime during the, sometimes during the week and after hours as well very popular wedding venue in fact uh funnily enough i am go going to get married here uh myself next year um yeah yeah Congratulations. Uh, so, so i recommend it uh it's you know it's really nice of course it has that fairy tale castle kind of quality to it but which is romantic but it's also really good if you if you want like a church style wedding but for whatever reason you don't want to actually do it in a church the Great Hall is a nice substitute because it's modeled after a cathedral, uh, of course. Uh, and we're very inclusive, all kinds of different marriage services and everything. And we try to work with people to find, you know, the best way to make their day happen. Um, it's not my department, but, uh, but speaking on behalf of that department, um, they're really committed to uh, making each wedding as special for people as it possibly can be. Well, I've always wanted to get married in a library, but uh, obviously a <laughs> castle is right up there too, but I'm already married, so it doesn't it doesn't help anymore. Um, do you have a link that you could put in the chat for the uh, museum's public outreach activities and programming? Um, I put a link to the um, museum itself in the chat, but if you could find something that uh, specifically people could go to. Um, well, I mean, you can honestly, you can find everything from hammondcastle.org. You can also follow us on Facebook, um, mm -hmm. Hammond Castle uh, on YouTube. Um, we do, we have a lot of videos uh, available, videos I've produced, educational ones, short videos on different topics. Um, so if you put Hammond Castle into YouTube, you'll find our, our page, a lot of content out there. Um, so those are the main ways um, uh, to get in contact with us. And you can find, uh, if you're interested in donating, if you're interested in becoming a member, or visiting, scheduling a special event, whatever it is, you can find it at hammondcastle.org. Okay. A um, couple people have also asked if you're going to, uh, once the organ is redone, if you'll be having concerts and if, and one person said that would be an amazing fundraiser. Yeah. Uh, our plan is to have concerts again, not necessarily with the entire organ at once, because there's a lot of different divisions to it and they're, they can be played independently. So the goal right now, as far as I understand it, is to get one or two of the divisions playable to have concerts and then hopefully use that as a springboard for getting 
uh, more of the restoration done. The restoration projects has been kind of quietly going on for, for quite a while at this point. Mm -hmm. And we are, are hopeful to have it playing again as, it, uh, as soon as, as we can, but it's, it's a big project and it really can't happen unless our, our ocean facing uh, towers are restored. There's a lot of water damage mm -hmm. um, that gets in and those chambers are right there. So we have to kind of make sure that that's the structural integrity of the building is kept in place. But um, we have a very devoted team um, who's working uh, basically all the time on this project in one form or another. So mm -hmm. we, we have our hopes. I have a few more questions and I, sure. I know we've gone over, but um, this is about <clears throat> the integrity of the castle, as you said. Is it affected mm -hmm. by storms and storm surge and climate change, have you noticed? Or is there studies? Well, not not specifically that, not specifically related to that issue. Um, it's definitely a factor. I mean, we're located. I mean, you can see if I if I show the uh, the slide again, you can see how close we are mm -hmm. to the ocean there. So you've got not only water, you've got salt air. Um, all of these things can cause a lot of tricky problems. For example. Um, I do presentations on medieval arms and armaments as part of our pro educational programming. And I will tell you, keeping the rust off because of our proximity is a constant battle. I have to do all kinds of crazy things to keep that stuff clean and keep the rust from coming back immediately. It's, 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 a, real, it's a real struggle. So it's definitely this region, this area, and I'm, and I'm sure you know, climate change plays a role in exacerbating the situation. Mm -hmm. One of our attendees being... Um inveterate basically went to your website and cannot find the tw november 22nd game night on your website so um Should be on our events calendar um okay. i can try to i can try to find it myself um that's okay it's, def well, it's definitely it. it's definitely happening i can tell you that um so let me see if i can find a direct link um november Oh, actually, it might be the 24th. I was told the 22nd. It looks like they may have moved it to the 24th, so I apologize for that. Um, so, yeah, I will pit, post a link in the chat here um, about that if you are interested. Just give me one second to do that. All right, so that should take you right there. So I apologize. Yeah, the 24th. Perfect. Um, um, I'll put that yeah, in my we recap have... email as well. Yeah, so we will have Hammond's uh, board game available, like I said, for sale and for play. I think it's really good. It plays like sort of a naval version of chess. It's a very strategic, <laughs> tactical kind of thing. Well, that brings me to my next question. Blake says, do you know of any instances when the Hammond torpedo actually sunk an enemy ship? Uh, no. Okay, so here's the thing about Hammond's torpedoes. So they were sold to the U.S. government officially in 1932. He started petitioning for this as early as 1916. Uh, House of Representatives initially approved the budget, Senate vetoed it, and he actually let them use his, a lot of his technology for y many years after that without being paid. In fact, to the point where it, it got a little problematic that he wasn't paid for the use of his patents um, until 1932, and he was paid uh, $750,000 for that, which is around 14 or so million or something like that today. Um, now, these were an experimental weapon. The Navy was trying to see if these had potential, um, but the problem is they kept being jammed. Um, they kept being jammed by enemy uh, radio signals. And if that happens, they can't reach their target. So of all people, a woman that some of you might've heard of, Hedy Lamar, who was a Hollywood actress and an amateur uh, sort of inventor and scientist herself, for some reason got interested in this topic and came up along with a friend of hers who was a pianist on a patent of her own that used a modified player piano to cycle through 88 for, for the number of keys on a piano, different frequencies rapidly. We call this frequency hopping. It's a fundamental principle in wireless communications today. And basically the idea is if you launched a torpedo at a target, okay, and they jammed it, they'd only be able to do it for basically a second before, boom, it switches to another frequency and you can get, regain control. And there's a deep, and the, and the allies would know what that code is. And basically she improved Hammond's designs. Was she given credit for it? No, 
The U.S. government actually seized her patent as alien property because she had Austrian heritage, and this was during World War II, hmm. um, which is really sad. And they ended up first using it, I believe, in 20 years later after the patent actually expired um, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, I want to say, is when it was first actually employed in any. But yeah, to go back to the original question, no, I don't know of any actual thing. There, there was a lot of tests. Um, Hammond did earlier than, than World War II in 1921, he did use his wireless technology to equip the USS Iowa, which was a battleship that was left over from the Spanish-American War um, as part of training. Um, so basically a, a full battleship was controlled using Hammond's technology. Mm -hmm. um, Marie Benedict has a great book about this, The Only Woman in the Room by about Hedy Lamar. So I've already oh, yeah. read her book about that. Fascinating um, person herself. <clears throat> I'm not sure you showed us if there were servants' quarters. Did the family's domestic workers live overnight at the castle? Yeah, some of them did and some of them didn't. It was a mixture. Some of them commuted and, and went to their own homes at night. And some of them did live on the premises like Leslie Hillman, the butler. Those rooms are not open to the public today. They are, I can tell you roughly where they are. So if you were to take that spiral staircase that leads to the early American room to the Butler's office, there's a doorway that leads to more bedrooms from there. And uh, that's where the live-in staff would have lived. Okay, all right. And last question, because this is important because um, a lot of libraries have passes for the trustees of reservation groups. So is Hammond Castle part of that um, pass program? Oh, uh, with the, yeah, not presently. This is something that I think we... I personally think we should be doing, and it's something that has been discussed before. Um, actually, I have a friend in contact who works for uh, Rockport Library, for example, mm -hmm. who um, I've been talking with, and, and I would, we don't currently have it. I think we should have it. I hope we will have it sooner rather than later is all I can really say about that at the moment. Okay. Well, libraries will appreciate it if that happens. And so yeah, I've used those passes myself. You know, they're great. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, John, so much for this. Thank you for everybody who's been here and putting up with my croaky voice. But this has really been fascinating. And um, I hope we can get you back maybe like January, February to talk a little bit more in depth about Hammond himself. And Absolutely. I would love to. Okay. We will find a date. So everybody, thank you so much. And I will, I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. I am going to go and take a nap and have a cup of tea. Not in that order. <laughs> good, night, good day, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, John.